The Daring class would be the largest and last class of gun-based destroyers built for the Royal Navy. Their design grew from concepts for an enlarged version of the Battle class, taking advantage of the ever-increasing pace of technological development. Indeed, the reason the two enlarged battles were cancelled was because both gun and electronic systems were advancing so quickly that the continual reworks of that particular design had pretty much reached an endpoint. Only two to three years after they'd first been conceived, and a clean sheet design was needed to take advantage of all the new shiny toys. Even so, the design would see a number of developments during construction. But at their baseline, the ships were armed with six rapid-fire dual-purpose 4.5-inch guns in three twin mounts, two super-firing forward and one aft, using the latest Mark VI mounting. Six 40mm Bofors in three twin mounts made up the dedicated anti-aircraft battery with two quintuple, or pentad in Royal Navy terms, torpedo launchers, and a squid anti-submarine mortar making up the balance of the weapon's loadout. There was a fairly drawn out process to reach this point though, with earlier iterations carrying a mixed 20 and 40mm anti-aircraft battery, some discussion of having three Pentad launchers for 15 torpedo tubes, and some thought even given to making them anti-aircraft pickets or even fighter direction and control ships. Whilst none of this came to pass, they did, during this period, pick up a proper laundry, electric cooking equipment, and other small crew-based improvements. There would also be on-again, off-again studies into fitting the ships with surface-to-air missiles later on in their lifetime that never really got past the drawing board as far as active service vessels were concerned. A total of 20 ships were planned, 16 for the Royal Navy and 4 for the Royal Australian Navy, but post-war economy measures saw this cut down to 8 and 3, respectively. Following a hybrid of previous Royal Navy destroyer design traditions, the ships had a class name instead of a letter, but all of the names would start with the same letter. And thus, after some renaming to deal with cancellations, the Royal Navy would receive Daring, Delight, Dainty, Diamond, Defender, Decoy, Diana, and Duchess, perhaps lucking out on missing out on Desperate, but also perhaps sadly not getting a hold of Dogstar and Dragon. The Australians would receive Vampire, Vendetta, and Voyager, whilst missing out on Waterhen, and a point and a cookie in the comments if you realise where those names came from. Whilst the 40mm battery was considerably smaller than that of the Battle class, both they and the 4.5 inch guns were equipped with fully automatic blind fire radar systems, with the heavier guns also having full remote power control. In theory, this would allow a daring to engage up to four targets simultaneously with accurate gunfire, even if it was sailing through a fog thick enough that they couldn't even see the other end of the ship. Albeit that two of these targets would have to be in the longer 4.5 inch gun range envelope, whilst the other two could be engaged by the 40mm batteries. There would, of course, be some variants. Two of the Australian ships replaced one of the twin 40mm guns with two single weapons, and they would also be fitted with the more advanced Limbo anti-submarine system. Machinery was arranged with alternating boiler and engine spaces for better survivability, and the new power plant used high-pressure units for the first time in Royal Navy destroyer service, allowing the 2,800-ton ships to motor along at 30 knots using 54,000 shaft horsepower on two shafts. Uh, for reference, the slightly heavier World War I-era Arethusa-class cruisers had been only 20 feet longer, had four shafts, and actually been one and a half knots slower, and only able to fit 40,000 shaft horsepower into their much simpler hulls. The fact that these ships were almost the size of a small World War I era light cruiser also says something about the expansion of ship class sizes in the intervening time. Other variations present in the design included the use of direct current electrical systems in the first four Royal Navy ships, as opposed to alternating current in the second four, the use of mixed riveting and welding in three of the vessels, and air conditioning installed in the Australian ships. As planned, the ships should have been all welded construction from the beginning, but Daring Decoy and Diana were built as mentioned, with a composite of welding and riveting to save time and money.
Over time, the various ships would diverge even further, with the first four Royal Navy ships losing their second torpedo launcher in the late 1950s in favour of additional berthing, whilst the latter batch had a single, more advanced 40mm Bofors replace the two Stag II twin mounts, which would also later be retrofitted onto the earlier group, along with the loss of the final torpedo launcher for those four ships. The class would serve in both navies from commission in the 1950s, which was somewhat delayed owing to the transfer of shipyard priority to rebuilding the merchant navy, which was considered to be a higher priority in the immediate peacetime to rebuild the economy, and they would last until the 1970s, with HMAS Voyager being lost to the voracious bowels of HMAS Melbourne, but her sister Vampire would survive all the way to 1986 in a training role before becoming a museum ship. Two of the British ships, Diana and Decoy, were sold to Peru, with the renamed Palacios lasting until 1993, and Ferre lasting until 2007. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.